Good morning and welcome to the 25th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Uh, I ask everyone in the public gallery to switch off their electronic devices or at least switch them to silent mode so that they do not affect the committee's work. Uh, we have apologies this morning from Jackie Bailey. And the first item on our agenda is a decision on taking business in private. Do we agree to take item three on the agenda in private? Yeah. Thank you, the Committee Signals Agreement. Uh, item two on our agenda is the NHS Workforce Planning Programme. Uh, we'll now take evidence on the Auditor General for Scotland's report on the NHS Workforce Planning from uh, John Burns, who is the Regional Implementation Lead for the West of Scotland and Chief Executive of NHS Ayrshire and Arran. Good morning. Uh, Tim Davidson, the Regional Implementation Lead for the East of Scotland and Chief Executive of NHS Lothian. Good morning. Uh, Caroline Lamb, National Board Implementation Lead and Chief Executive of NHS Education for Scotland. Good morning. And Malcolm Wright, who is the Regional Implementation Lead for the North of Scotland and Chief Executive of NHS Grampian. Good morning. Uh, none of you have requested to make an opening statement. I believe that remains the case. So we'll just go straight into committee's questions with Colin Beattie. Thank you, Peter. Um, I've got one or two random questions that comes out of this. Um, clearly, this is only a snapshot of about 60% of the workforce of the NHS. It's not 100% a, a of, the, of the workforce, and probably that's worth bearing in mind. But looking at uh, the Auditor General's comments, um, in her report on paragraph 50 on page 27, she says there is a risk that the sheer number of workforce plans and the number of different workforce groups involved may become a barrier to effective working. And in your own submission, in paragraph 4.2, you say that it's not really clear how all this is going to be handled. And, but this is not something that's come up overnight. I mean, workforce planning has been on the go for a while. And I find it a little astonishing that in such a key area, it's not clear how this is going to happen and that you're going to wait for a national workforce planning group to provide leadership. Haven't you been pro providing leadership in your own areas? So I, I, I could start. I mean, I think the difficulty has been that there have been too many leaders, perhaps all ploughing lone furrows. And so we've had, um, you know, policy leads at government level. We've had uh, health boards, 22 health boards, each determining their own workforce plans. We've got um, councils, of course, producing their own workforce plans. And increasingly, nothing we do in the health service can be seen as being divorced from the broader public sector workforce, and in particular, the health and social care workforce issues. And of course, we've got the recently the new kids on the block with uh, the integration joint boards, 31 new authorities, all of which have uh, a, a responsibility and a role in, in developing workforce plans. So I think I mean, the key thing from us that comes out of the Auditor General's report that we agree with is that it is now a, a time to try to pull together all of these various uh, loan furrows into something that's more coherent, and that's something that has been lacking. But supposedly this has been... Uh, uh scheduled to happen for a long time. It's not something that's happened overnight. I mean, pulling this together has been an aspiration for a number of years. I think, to be fair, the regions are very new constructs. We've only been appointed as regional leads uh, for the last six months. Integration joint boards have only been in place for 20 months. So, I mean, I think there, there is a new landscape, and that's a new opportunity for us to work more collaboratively, which is what I think we're seeking to do. And if I can maybe add to that, I think one of the other recommend, key recommendations from the Audit Scotland report was about the data that we have and making sure that we're able to better use that data and join it together. So I think I think that one of the one of the um, uh, recommendations, one of the, the actions in the Scottish Government's Workforce Plan Part One around having clear leadership about pulling that data together is really important and that's work that's now underway so I think there's some real opportunities there for us in terms of new approaches to data and new tools and techniques in in using that data to forecast not just to look at the position that we're in now but also to use it much more intelligently to forecast where we might be in the future based on multiple scenarios. Um, looking at page nine of your report the top paragraph you say work is underway to try and bring key workforce data together into a single platform that sounds like a very big job. Has there been a budget attached to this? If so, how much? Um, you know, what resources have been diverted to doing this? Right, it is a big job. Um, 
So in the current year, NHS Education for Scotland has received an additional allocation of 100,000 from Scottish Government to start the work on that. I think it's also important to remember, though, that there are lots of pockets of um, capacity and capability around this, around Scotland in different organisations. So it's not just about additional funding, it's also about making best use of the resource that we already have in the system. And it's very much as well about looking at how we can join up technologies, not just within health, but also more broadly. So we're working with the Care Inspectorate and with the Scottish Social Services Council to look to pull together the data that we've got within health and join that up with the, with the data across care. And in fact, there's a, there's a workshop of interested stakeholders from across health, care and, and, and wider than that um, happening tomorrow, which will be the first of a planned series of workshops to make sure that what we're doing in pulling together the data in a single platform responds to what stakeholders need out of that. £100,000 isn't going to take you very far on an IT project. £100,000 is what we will be using in the current year to get additional capacity to pull together the technical aspects of joining the data up. I think the challenge will then come when we start to need to to um, look at uh, data analysts and data scientists to make sure that we're able to, to get make best use of that data. So there's a technical aspect to this, and then there's the taking what we've got at the moment, which is um, I had described to me as a, a, an ocean of data, and turning that into a wealth of intelligence. You've given some examples of the different IT systems that uh, are going to have to be brought together. Um, it seems a very complex business given the sheer number of systems yes and we don't underestimate the complexity but it's not about pulling all those it systems together it's making sure that we're able to join up the data that's in those systems so it's not about trying to move to a single system within which we we um, hold every bit of workforce data. It's about creating a data lake that pulls the data that's relevant from those systems and, and is able to join those up. And I think there is some quite good experience of doing that. So if I look at the UK medical data um, database, then, then there's, there's areas we can learn from in our approach to that. I said I was going to bounce around a little. On page 10, the last uh, paragraph, you okay. say... Just briefly, because I just want to follow up on, just to develop a point Colin's just made. Uh, when, when you're talking, Caroline Lamb, about that IT project, do you speak for all of the boards? Uh, so when you're saying we are developing this, uh, are you saying that all of the boards are involved in this uh, throughout Scotland? And presumably there's a project team. That's not you individually who are dealing with this. No, no, it's not, not, just, not just me individually or indeed my team individually. Um, what we're, so all the boards are involved in this. All the boards in Scotland will be um, users of the data, the data platform that we've been charged with developing. So, yeah, we are at early stages of this. As I said, there's a first workshop that pulls together a number of stakeholders happening tomorrow. So we're at early stages of this and we're starting to scope up exactly what's required. And that involves identifying what data we already have, but also identifying some of the gaps where we, we might need to collect additional data to give us the best possible intelligence for the future. So there's presumably a staff that's been assigned to do that, uh, and it, which, which has a recruitment challenge, I guess, but also it begs the question of when will this be done? Uh, yes, we have got staff working on this now. As I say, we're at early stages, so we need to understand exactly what the scope of the project looks like, and that will be informed by the workshops that are starting to happen. So we are starting to scope that up. We're looking towards having a proof of concept that will demonstrate what can be done with the data um, early in, in the next calendar year. Um, but that will then be a very much an incremental process because we, we need to start with what we've got and then look to develop that. So when will it be done? I can't give you exact timelines at the moment. A speculation, a ballpark? I, I, I really wouldn't want to speculate. I, 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 the position that we're in at the moment is we, we are starting to understand what data we have and starting to look at the complexity of joining that up. There is a, then another stage of identifying the data that we don't have, and that will be another stage for complexity in, in, in understanding how we pull that together. So at the moment, I think it's premature to give timelines, but we are working very hard to get to the point where we will understand exactly what we're able to do and how quickly we're able to do that. Thank you, Colin.
Thank you. Um, page 10, that final paragraph. When you're talking about reducing senior management costs, is that across the whole of the NHS or just within your own boards? Uh, I think the figure relates to the, the, whole of the, the whole of NHS Scotland, yeah. The whole of NHS Scotland. Yeah. What, was the, what was the actual cash savings there? That figure. Who would have that figure? Uh, we could probably supply it, I would think, to the committee. I'd be interested in, I'd be interested in seeing that. Yeah. Um, just looking at the uh, comments on doctors and the impact of out of our services on page 33, which I think you've got a copy of. Um, we're talking about uh, older GPs contributing on average a greater contribution of working hours than younger GPs. That's our, our page is numbered, sorry. Ah. Uh, it's probably the final paragraph of the of the spice oh, briefing. The spice briefing. The spice briefing. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Do you agree with that analysis? I'm sorry. Could you repeat that yeah. question? Well, what they're saying here is that over the last few years, older GPs working on uh, out of our services are contributing on average a greater contribution of working hours than younger GPs, would you say that's a correct analysis? Yes, absolutely. That's that's what we've seen. I mean, one of the things that I think we allude to in our submission, I think we do need to talk about, is there has been a significant societal shift in our workforce. And uh, if, um, aspirations around work-life balance are far more apparent now than they have been over the course of my 34-year career. And, uh, and, and, and um, I think the difficulty we're having in staffing um, services that require intensive 24-7 rotors um, uh, reflects that. So I think that is a very, a very significant issue, yeah. And, the, and, of course, the growth in less than full-time working uh, is, is, a, is a signal of that as well. I mean, we do pay relatively across the NHS our workforce well, and so staff can have a good standard of living working part-time and without uh, the, you know, the extra payments of out-of-hours. And I think people are significantly, increasingly making work balance choices that would tend to move them away from intensive out-of-hours routers. Yeah. In your submission, you indicate that the pattern of uh, students in training and so on seems to indicate that a large proportion of them will be moving into part-time part -time work rather than full-time work. Yeah, what, what we indicated, what, what, um, what we've demonstrated is the number of trainees, and these are postgraduate trainees rather than, than students, rather, not so they're at the postgraduate training level. So we have seen a consistent increase in the number of postgraduate trainees who are training on a less than full-time basis. And there are two impacts of that. One is that it means it takes longer for them to qualify as consultants or as general practitioners, but also it, it may indicate, we don't know for certain, but it may indicate that they're more likely to want to work less than full time once they're fully qualified. To, to that, because my reading of uh, Sir Lewis Ritchie's report, I very much agree with the analysis that, that, that is here. Um, and, and in terms of, I think, one of the points he was trying to get over was how do we make this more attractive for young GPs to do some out of hours? So I think he was arguing the case that if more GPs did out of hours but to a lesser extent, mm -hmm. then the burden wouldn't be so much placed on some of the GPs who were maybe towards the end of their career. And I think the second thing to add into that is the diversification of the workforce actually doing out of hours work. So over recent years, we've seen quite a, an increase in the number of advanced nurse practitioners, for example, who are working alongside GPs to provide comprehensive out of hours care. So it, it is about GPs and distributing the load, but it's also about a multi-professional workforce that can provide this service. Well, clearly, the, the <coughs> older GPs are coming up to retirement, a lot of them. Um, so how, how do we cover this? can't just keep churning out more GPs. Is there an additional cost to this d changing pattern of how GPs are working? And how can you incentivize them? You know, we talk about uh, a work-life work, uh, work -life, uh, balance, but uh, the fact is, at the end of the day, we need people to cover these jobs. Well, we do. And, and you know, if I, I mean, it's, I think it's a broader point when 
looking forward to our workforce plans that um, I think we need to think uh, very carefully about um, who we are recruiting to medical schools and being clear about the requirement for 24-7 working if people want to work in the NHS. I mean, there, w there was a, a, a tradition over the last few decades that uh, particularly in the medical profession, junior doctors took the burden of the 24-7 workload, and then once consultants, the uh, doctor became a consultant, they would go to work much more daytime, Monday to Friday hours, apart from their on-call commitment. Um, and uh, if you compare that and contrast that to the nursing workforce, where generally speaking, we recruit nurses from day one with an understanding that they're going to be working shifts and covering 24-7 workforce patterns. So I think that when we're thinking longer term, and you'll know from our submission that it takes a minimum of 15 years to train a consultant from start to finish. So if we raise our gaze a bit and think beyond the next 10, 20 or 30 years, I think we have to look at the recruitment principles for bringing undergraduates into medical school and make sure recruiting people who understand and that a career in medicine for the future will involve significant 24-7 working. And just to add it in, into that, I think re recruiting people into medicine in the context of a multi-professional workforce, mm -hmm. so actually advanced nurse practitioners, um, allied health professionals who are taking on extended roles, pharmacists who are taking on extended roles, radiographers who are taking on extended roles, you know, what... Um, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago when people were recruited into medicine, the pattern of the service that we have now is very different from what it was before. So I think societal expectations are really changing. Uh, people's expectations of, of having a, a work-life balance and the amount of hours that they're going to work. So I do think it is about, uh, as Tim says, it's about the expectations of doctors coming into medicine, but it's also about diversifying and broadening the workforce that we've got in the NHS in Scotland. And, you know, during the course of this session I'd like to lead some examples of some of the things that actually are happening to you know to, to make that reality. So who's going to drive this change? Well, I, would, I would suggest that we're already uh, driving some of this change. If I look at some of the examples in my own board in Ayrshire, uh, we are already diversifying uh, the workforce in the out of hours area where we are bringing together uh, yes the GPs but advanced nurse practitioners, pharmacists, we're bringing in uh, social care into those teams and we're bringing uh, crisis uh, mental health teams. So there is a, a, a wider multidisciplinary approach and that's helping reshape and it's, uh, and, and it's looking to the future and it's trying to then ensure that we, we develop that workforce because that's proving to be, I think, successful and I think it addresses some of the challenge around uh, the, 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 work, the, the GP workforce. Uh, and, and I think that's where we need to be focusing in that broader workforce because I think that will be where we'll make the difference. So is it up to individual boards then to drive this change or should it be done nationally? How would, how would it filter down to, to, to the level that people are sitting in front of you and being told what's the expectation? I don't, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both and. So if we look at the um, uh, government's policy and around pharmacists, for example, um, that is very much that they're going to work alongside GPs who want to extend the role of pharmacists. Um, so that, that, is, that is national policy. So pharmacists who are being trained through university and through their postgraduate education are being prepared for very different roles. And certainly on the, on the ground, uh, within primary care, within Grampian Health Board, for example, we've got just under 60 pharmacists who are working in primary care settings alongside GPs doing some of the work that GPs would have done before. So it is a part, partly about national policy, but it's also about making sure that these things are implemented on the ground in order to su support GPs who are under a, you know, tremendous pressure at the moment. And to give you an example of, of the, the national element of that, then obviously there's a, the, the, there is a, a huge training programme around pharmacists and pharmacy technicians to support them in working alongside GPs and GP practices. So on the figures that I have are we've got 178 pharmacists and 41 pharmacy technicians in those, in those programmes. So, so as Malcolm says, it's a combination of the, the training being provided on a national basis so that everybody's trained to the same standards and then and NHS boards being able to take advantage of that and pull those people into work alongside their GPs. What you're talking about will relieve the pressure on GPs at a local level. It doesn't necessarily encourage them to uh, do out-of-hours work. Well, the point I was making 
something I think does require a national approach, but also, of course, in collaboration with the universities. I mean, the, the point I was making really was that if we project forward, what do we need from our workforce increasingly for, in particular, unscheduled care services and critical care services? We need a workforce, as you've described yourself, that is able to work 24-7. I think we've been more successful in that in nursing. I think there are lessons we can learn from that. But essentially, I think the expectation needs to be set for undergraduates considering entry into medical school that um, uh, the health service needs to operate 24-7 and people should expect to work uh, shifts for the majority of their career. Now, we also say, of course, you know, looking forward, the normal retirement age for NHS staff is likely to be, you know, 67 or 68 fairly, fairly um, shortly. And so we do need to look at how staff towards the end of their careers working into their mid and late 60s can you know work in these intensive um, services and so we may well have to front load quite a lot of that so that there is the possibility that younger staff uh, you know, cover the 24 7 shifts more than the older staff and older staff maybe have the opportunity to do a bit less but emphasize that this work-life balance is an important factor for a lot of the younger doctors and I'm not sure sitting a student down and saying, you know, if you go into this, you're going to have to do 24-7 all the Is that going to actually persuade them? Well, therein is the problem that, you know, we, we, we do have uh, some, some uh, polarities here, some irreconcilables. But interesting, I mean, it, it, now we're, I think, forming the view that for every medic who retires, we need to be uh, training 1.5 to fill those medical posts to reflect the fact that people want to work less onerously and increasingly want to work less than full time. So the point Malcolm's making is that if we have more staff working less onerously, I think that's, that's, that is a more attractive proposition. The problem at the moment is that in particularly pressurised specialties, in the particularly acute 24-7 services like paediatrics is an example where we really struggle, uh, the intensity of the 24-7 requirement really puts people off. Isn't what you're saying going to result in a, a much higher cost to the NHS? Well, not necessarily if we have more people working fewer hours. I mean, you know, I, I, I suppose, generally speaking, the more whole-time equivalent staff we have, because they all have holidays and they all have sick pay and they all have, you know, leave entitlements, etc., then probably there would be a marginal increase. But fundamentally, I think that is the answer. We are going to have... We, we have to recognise increasingly amongst the workforce that we are going to have more staff wanting to work less than full-time and less intensively out of hours. So the only proposition, I think, is to have more people working fewer hours less intensively. One of the things I'm, I'm really um, focused about is how we make professional careers more attractive in Scotland, um, because we're in a UK labour market, we're in an international labour market, and what are the things that we can do in Scotland would differentiate us from other parts of the, of, of the UK? I think one of those things is around really pushing the whole multi-professional workforce. So to say that doctors coming through, be it a GP or a consultant, you're not on your own. The service doesn't fully, you know, rely on you, but you're part of a multi-professional team. So you know, an example of, of that would be the work that's gone on and has been led by by Nez and, and Caroline about using radiographers and developing radio radiographers to to read images and do reporting and work alongside consultants and doing work that consultants, some work that consultants would have done uh, previously. Now that, that is a development that we're seeing happening in different boards at different rates around Scotland, but it is actually happening. So, you know, the, the notion that the consultant radiologist and the radiographer and the technicians are working together as part of a multi-professional team, and if you add into that, you know, good links with the universities, opportunities to do teaching and, and research, actually you create an environment that people will want to come and work in. And I think focus on what can differentiate Scotland vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the UK, I think that's where we need to be focusing our energy. I'd like to absolutely support, support that. I think it's really important that we focus not just on doctors and what they've traditionally done or nurses and what they've traditionally done, but on the, the much broader team across NHS Scotland and look to ensure that every member of staff is able to contribute up to the level of their, their skills. And not just that, but also that we have clearly defined career pathways for staff so that staff can see ways in which they can develop and grow their careers um, and, and that we're able to make the best of their contributions. I think, I think it's important that we 
we recognise that we've started to make those changes. We've we've been looking beyond the traditional workforce and and uh, considering how. Uh, with the professions we have and the, the skills that they bring, how we maximise those skills. And it's about the, the value that people have in the job they do uh, and the contribution they make. And we're seeing that across a range of disciplines and you know, colleagues have, have identified some of the, those areas. And I think that's something that we, we, we will build on. It doesn't take away from all of the challenges that, that we face in terms of workforce planning, but we must plan not for what we had, but for what we're going to need in a redesigned health and care system for the future. Thank you. If I might, just uh, before bringing Alex Neil, just to pick up a, a, a point that's been made there, the joint written submission that you put in uh, at the start talks about the continued growth of the workforce as a response is not feasible, uh, and a continual expansion of the workforce would be neither affordable nor available. And what it says is the focus will be on how we utilise the existing workforce more effectively in the future. Uh, which uh, I think was the point that certainly Caroline Lamb you were alluding to. Uh, but you also talk about in your submission there are uh, circa 350 different NHS roles, many of which have different training and education pathways. Within each of those there are sub-specialities and roles which can vary greatly between departments, services and organisations. So if it is the intention to meet the, the future demands by staff redevelopment rather than recruitment, uh, that has huge implications for the NHS. Uh, is the NHS set up to do this? Are the training providers set up to do this? Are you really going to meet the challenge by recalibrating your entire workforce? Well, I think the answer is we don't know yet. Um, and, and this is the huge problem. And there, there is no plan, I think, across uh, Scotland or the UK that accurately at this stage describes what a redesigned health and social care workforce might look like for the future. That is the, that is the huge challenge that the Auditor General is throwing down in her report, is that we've got an aspiration to fundamentally redesign the way in which we deliver care, that we shift the balance of care into the community, that in, in, in increasingly we're going to try to uh, encourage our population to take more responsibility for their own health, to um, increasingly self-manage their condition, uh, to be able to utilise digital technology and digital interactions with, uh, with health rather than necessarily turn up at centres, that we're going to have increasingly an integrated workforce in the community. So what does that mean? At the moment, you know, for example, we have consultant geriatricians, we have district nurses, we have social care staff. Increasingly, we're going to have to be thinking about a workforce that is a generic workforce providing care right across the spectrum of health and social care rather than individual professionals providing a little slice of somebody's care in the community. So that, that challenge is that at a very high rhetorical level, I think some of us kind of understand that challenge, but distilling that into exactly Exactly. What is the workforce? What is the what is the role? What is the job description? What's the grade of pay? Uh, we're still a long way away from that. So, so, so I, I would add to that that I think just now, uh, with the uh, implement the introduction of regional uh, delivery planning that, that we we are responsible for for leading on. Uh, that's giving us an opportunity, certainly uh, from a West perspective, to look across the West of Scotland, uh, to think about uh, workforce in uh, uh, that wider context. Um, and I think as we develop those plans, uh, rightly, we will uh, be bringing forward the, uh, what those workforce consequences are as we shape. And then we need to link that with what's happening in the integrated joint boards. Uh, and ensure that the workforce planning is linked uh, from those lo very local plans through board plans and where appropriate is, is connected and linked into to regional plans. And I think it's as those service plans develop, then some of those uh, questions around what that future workforce needs to be uh, will evolve further. Uh, but I think it will build on work that we've already started. Another level of complexity in this is that we also need to work with the regulators and with the professional bodies that set the curricula for, for many of our clinical cohorts of staff. So um, the shape of training report on, 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 on medical tr postgraduate training, uh, which has now been signed up to by all the, the, the UK countries, is a really important development in terms of getting more flexibility into medical training, which is absolutely what we need for the future. And we just need to make sure that that now gets speedily implemented through the, the regulators who have responsibility for this.
I do think we need to work at, at, at multiple levels. And I, I think you know there are UK dimensions to all of this. So decisions that the Department of Health and Whitehall take around training numbers have an impact on, 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 on training availability here with, within Scotland. I, th I think we are making improvements in terms of our national workforce planning. We're at reasonably early stages about regional workforce planning. I think health board workforce planning is is well developed and you know certainly from a Grampian Health Board point of view, we know what our workforce is like. We have a good idea of where we want to get it to and the, and the measures that we need to take to get from A to B, if you like. And I, I guess the point I want to get over is we need to be highly adaptive uh, at a local level to changing um, labour market um, uh, conditions. So, you know, for example, um, work we've done with the University of Aberdeen around uh, introducing physician associates, um, which, which is a, a new role. Uh, we can actually attract in people from a science background who wouldn't normally come into a health se service career, give them a three-year training program, um, give them their, their degree certificate at the end of it, give them professional oversight and supervision, and they're working to support GPs and consultants in Grampian Health Board uh, today. And we've had a number of phases of that program coming forward. So I think um, having local adaptability and responding to local la labour market conditions is also going to be really really important so I guess it's the balance between having you know the national workforce plan with all of the data in it but lots of flexibility locally to make things happen on the ground uh, just before the, the committee on order explore this Tim Davison I, I think you said something at the start which I think the rest of you were agreeing with did you really just say to me there is no plan that we are sitting here with a crisis and there is no plan in existence to sort it out. Uh, is that really what I'm hearing from you? Well, I mean, I, I think the evidence shows that where there are multiple plans, there are probably too many plans, and there's, a, there's perhaps a distinction between the short-term operational plans that boards have hitherto been doing and what is now needed is a longer-term uh, plan. So, the, so, so, no, let me just... Let Mr me just Davidson, continue. this is... Colin Beattie posed the exact question uh, right at the start. Who hasn't done this? This is not rocket science with respect. You know, any, any business person knows that you develop a workforce plan. Yes, so I think Collectively, we have to hold our hands up and say across the entire system that we have not worked sufficiently together to align long-term future horizon planning together with short-term operational plans. I mean, that's Who has not done that, Mr. All, all, all of us, from, from health boards to government, we've, not, we've failed to... to uh, pull together the link between short-term operational delivery and longer-term workforce planning. And so, if I can just clarify what I was saying about a plan, we are being now challenged by the Auditor General to come up with an explicit workforce plan that um, shows how, over the short, medium and longer term, we can uh, uh, fulfil the policy imperatives of shifting the balance of care from hospital to community and deliver some of the major policy imperatives like improved elective capacity in hospitals, for example. At the moment, we do not have a workforce plan that describes at a national, regional and local level how we're going to do that, how much it's going to cost wh and where the workforce is. And that now is the challenge, absolutely. I, I must say, I, I find that extraordinary. Uh, however... The report says. Does oh, it not? Okay, can I, can I just... Uh, let me explore this a wee bit further. Um, I, my feeling ever since the time I was the Cabinet Secretary, I felt sometimes as though we were planning the journey for the next two or three years using the timetable from the two, three years past. And it seems to me that fundamental to all of this is that um, there is a missing link. If this was a business and you're writing a business plan, the first line in the business plan would be your sales forecast for the period of the business plan because the number of people you need working for you, the skills you need, the location of these people, the equipment you need, the estates you need, the whole thing would depend on your anticipated level of sales. Now, you can never get it absolutely right, but that is your planning tool, um, is the business plan, and line one is the forecast for sales. And it seems to me, and I tried to get this started when I was the health secretary, but I couldn't find anyone who understood business planning, quite frankly, in the whole of the Scottish government. Um, 
what we need, surely, before we get into workforce planning, is to understand over the next three years, over the next 10 years, and as you rightly say, Tim, over the longer period, what is likely to be um, the shape and size of demand on the health and social care system. Now, there's a number of factors we can be pretty sure about. We know the uh, 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 forecast from the Registrar General on the level of population. We're pretty sure about the overall age structure, and we can break that down into regions as well as into a uh, board level. It's fairly accurate. What we don't know is what diseases are likely to emerge and, and all that sort of stuff. But as you see in here about workforce planning, we need some scenario planning. We had a report during the summer which pointed out that 25 conditions account for 70% of NHS activity. So if you even get that 70% right uh, and, and you don't get the other 30%, as right as accurate, at least that's a major, major improvement of where we are today. So would you agree the starting point in all of this should be a proper systematic forecast of the shape and level of demand for the period covering the planning scenarios? And from that, and only when you can get that uh, level and shape of demand, are you then in a position to take a decision about what kind of workforce and what size of workforce and what location of the workforce needs to be in order to deliver on that level of demand. Not just the workforce, but it would also determine the, the shape of the east, tomorrow's estate, uh, the use of uh, artificial intelligence. I mean, for example, the Japanese last week announced that they've just developed artificial intelligence that can diagnose bowel cancer in 10 seconds with 98% accuracy. Now, if we introduce that into GP surgeries, say, in Scotland in the next two or three years, that's going to change uh, a lot. Um, and I just picked that as one example. So it's, it's never entirely accurate, but surely the starting point has to be not how many workers we need, but what is the level and the shape of the demand going to be? Because that determines everything else. And there's no work being done in that long term. Is that right? Because so, so I, uh, I, I agree that, that that is the starting point. And uh, if I look at the work we are doing in Ayrshire um, and uh, the early work that we're doing around our regional uh, delivery planning, that's exactly where uh, we're starting, is looking at that population uh, uh, health need. Um, but then trying to um, uh, work through how, uh, with uh, innovation and technological, technological change, how we might look to deliver services differently, uh, that service model would shape. Uh, and I agree with you in terms of that then takes you forward to uh, understanding how you, looking forward, adapt and innovate around uh, your workforce, how you deliver services, uh, and, and, and your estate and infrastructure and, and, and assets. Uh, so I, I do think that... Um, uh, document, John, that needs to be updated at least every year <laughs> but to take account of the kind of changes that you're talking yeah. about. Obviously, even if it's a 20-year plan, it should be updated regularly to take account of these developments because some of them are foreseen, a lot of them will be unforeseen. Um, but the other thing is, you say that's happening in Ayrshire, but surely that's the starting point at a Scottish level. Yes, and... That, and who is it's not being done at a Scottish level? I think a lot of that information is available at, at a Scottish yeah. level. In but, terms but it's not pulled together, Malcolm. What, what we should be, what we should have, and what I certainly tried to set in motion, uh, was a, a national business plan for health and social care at, at that time up until 2030. Now, the first three years would be very detailed because that would need to cover the, the, the budgets for the next three years and all the rest of it. The further out you go, the more strategic in longer term it obviously becomes, and therefore the further out it's less likely to be as accurate as the next three years. But the point is it has to be a strategic document that includes basically an operational plan for the next three years on a rolling basis, so you update it every year. And if you pull that into one document so that everybody knows exactly what the plan is, the problem is, as Tim rightly said, is there's hundreds of plans covering everything under the sun uh, in all 
across Scotland with 53 and more organisations involved in delivery and nobody's pulling it all together. Surely the starting point is to look at the bring together the forecast on the shape and size of demand over the planning period uh, and then from that uh, deduce the workforce requirements, the state's requirements, the equipment requirements, the financial requirements and so on and so forth. And surely that should be done as one document and the Scottish Government or the health service at a Scottish level needs to be the one that does that. On specific one, because I, mean, I think it's just go back to the early point I was saying is that that's exactly what what um, we've been saying is that there are lots of plans. Health boards do have plans, but they've tended to be short term in nature. Increasingly now we have a new set of authorities, 31 integration authorities, who have a responsibility also to develop their workforce plans. And of course we have 32 councils who also have responsibilities for workforce plans. So there's no lack of planning, but the issue is how does it all pull together? The first recommendation of the Auditor General's report is that improving understanding of future demand to inform workforce planning. So the opportunity that we have looking forward is that we, we will have a Scottish Government uh, uh, committed to pulling all of that together to a national workforce plan. We will then have regional workforce plans. We will then have health board plans. We will then have IGP plans. When is well, that going to happen? Well, this is going to happen now over the course of the next year, two years and three years. But the problem, and the, uh, responding to Mr Kerr's question about is there a plan, no, of course there isn't a plan. We have not yet got a plan that reconciles the population demand that we're facing, and you'll see in the Auditor General report published last week, a significant increase in the over 65 population in Scotland at the same time as a reduction in the work working age population of 16 to 64, and now the health service going into real terms reductions in funding. So our challenge now is not just to pull together demand with workforce projections, but also to pull together service plans with workforce plans, with financial plans. But, but, but my and point, Tim, is that it has to come together in one document. And, yes. uh, and it has to, you have to be, you know, if you're running a business, I used to work for a multinational that was three times, four times the size of the health service in Scotland. And we produced plans uh, every year, long range plans that were updated every year. Uh, and, you know, the people worked in, I mean, alone in Europe, we had 15 different countries where we were operating, but it was all pulled together as a corporate plan uh, so that everybody knew what the sales targets were and, and what they needed to do in terms of workforce and all the rest of it to deliver that. So it's not rocket science. And, you know, it's something... I don't think the expertise exists uh, within the health service. I haven't seen it to bring it together the way it needs to be brought together. I actually think... We maybe need to buy in that expertise to get it done much quicker than is happening at the moment. And I think the message from the Auditor General's report last week was this should be done sooner rather than later. I don't think three years is an acceptable timetable to wait for a national plan that brings it all together. Uh, I understand the difficulties, I understand the challenges, I understand how desperate sometimes the organisation is, particularly now that social care is, is part and parcel of the plan. But I think given the forecasting software we have available to us nowadays, uh, which is widely used in other health systems, and not to mention the business planning software we have, it's not beyond the wit of man or woman to pull this together in the next 12 months, in my view. And I, I think that, that really should be the goal. I think the danger is everybody's away doing their own thing and nobody's pulling the whole thing together, starting with that top level on demand. I think that uh, the, the the regional dimension that we now have uh, that, that we've been working on over the last six months, um, I, I, I agree with you that there will be some uh, uh, national themes and, and directions. But if we look across the three regions, the populations do have uh, differences. And, and so I think planning on a regional basis, so in the west of Scotland, planning for uh, looking at that regional delivery planning for 2.7 million, looking at the population health need, and then bringing and working with colleagues regionally and nationally uh, to help bring that together. Um, and, and those first plans have to be in place uh, for March 18. Um, and I think that... So, or well, no, no. Uh, the regional delivery plan, uh, the regional delivery plans are looking at the, 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 the how we deliver our services. Yeah. Now they're not going but, to address everything but, in but, the. But will those include, will those include an assessment of the level and shape of demand for the longer term? 
That's what we are trying to do, certainly in the west of Scotland, is start with the population health need to, because by understanding that and understanding then uh, how we will adapt, because we need to adapt and change, uh, because this is about planning for what we had. This is about planning for what the future needs to be, uh, and, and, and it needs to be different. We need to adapt in the workforce that we have. We'll need to be, I think colleagues have mentioned, it needs to be, you know, we need to be able to adapt. But, but I, I agree with your fundamental point, and I think that that is what we have been asked to do as, uh, uh, through the regional delivery planning, is to, to provide that strategic uh, um, forward look, to use uh, and understand as best we can uh, the, the demand data that's there um, and, and certainly being used. Um, and I think in that, and, 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 and it is complex, and, and, and uh, I think we will have to look at uh, uh, that first you know, one to three years, but with a forward horizon in terms of uh, um, what we see ahead. But your point in terms of recognising that medical technologies change all the time, then we need to keep those uh, plans refreshed and updated. And indeed, as our populations change, we need to be able to, to, to reflect those plans as that demand changes. And will that plan include the financial plan? Yes, it needs to have a strategic because resourcing I think framework. That's a big fault in the national delivery plan, it doesn't mention the funding. Uh, it doesn't, you know, uh, look at where the funding is going to go and all the rest of it. If it's a genuine plan, it has to have a financial plan as part of it. Yes, and 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 we need to have all of the elements that you've described, um, including the workforce elements and the strategic resourcing elements uh, within. Two regions be doing the same in the same time scale. Yes. yes. To just add in from a, a North of Scotland uh, perspective, I think we've got a pretty good handle on the demography, the, the, you know, in terms of the, the burden of disease, the age profiles changing, uh, what people are actually going to need. Um, I think each of the regions will have a, uh, do have a requirement for a slightly different profile of workforce. So if you look at the north of Scotland, uh, which is covering something like 60% of the land mass of Scotland, has got only 25% of the population, and the dispersing of that population in remote and rural communities, we actually need and are going to need more of people with much more general skills who can work with people in the local communities using technology to avoid people having to travel to specialist centres when they don't need to travel to specialist centres. So I think we've got a pretty good um, idea of what's the money that we've got in the system. Um, you know, we, we look, we try to forecast where we think public expenditure is going to be going and what sort of envelopes of money that we've got to work with in the future. We've got a pretty good handle on the shape of the workforce that we've got within in the north of Scotland. Uh, and we're really developing um, to say, well, if we're not going to be able to hugely increase the workforce in terms of overall numbers, and I think, I, I don't think that's a, a realistic uh, possibility, how do we use the workforce that we've got in a different way? How do we diversify the workforce? How do we give people more general, broader training? How do we expand people's roles in order to fit them for the burden of, of disease and morbidity that we're going to be seeing in the future? Um, so I think, you know, I think workforce planning is very important, you know, particularly to inform Caroline and inform Scottish Government about, well, what are the undergraduate training numbers, what are the postgraduate training numbers, what are the nursing training numbers, and so forth. That is helpful, um, but as we've said in our evidence, this has got a really long time frame, and I think the thing we can be absolutely sure of is that when we make a decision here, things will happen in the middle, so by the time those people graduate, we're, we're living in a very different world. So I think you know, the point I was making about adaptability uh, it, it is very, very important. So from a north of Scotland perspective, I think we've got a handle on that. I think we've got a handle on the money. I think we know the burden of, of disease. We know the kind of distribution of services that we want. And I think it is about growing those generalist skills uh, for our workforce in the future. Good. That's very helpful, Malcolm. Can I just, because you referred to, uh, and this is where I wanted to, to focus a wee bit on, is the whole pipeline from undergraduates into medical school right through the pipeline. Um, because in your paper, you say that last year, 860 Scottish domicile school leavers applied to medicine through UCAS for the first time, and Scottish medical schools were seeking to fill only 834 home fee, i.e. UK and EU places in that year. But when you look, when you look at the um, paper by Spice, 
The first thing that strikes you is just, and I don't think this is the fault of the health service, I think the Scottish Funding Council are slacking here, uh, the lack of proper data uh, in terms of applications, dropout rates, destination figures and all the rest of it, the absence of reliable data is astounding and I think we need to write to the Scottish Funding Council to rectify this because how can the health service plan ahead if that basic raw data isn't available and it should be easy to collect. Uh, I can list later for the clerks where I think that's missing. But if you look, for example, at the figures, I mean, the University of Edinburgh, in terms of Scottish EU um, a, a, a applications for medical school last year, 1,372, 192 offers, and 115 were accepted, which was 40% of the offers. So my point is, if you've got 192 offers to Scottish and EU students, and only 40% of them take up the offer, um, and I realise that there's maybe a bit of fat in the number of offers from what we need, but surely if, if we are going to have the pipeline of medical graduates that we need, we need to substantially increase the number who are being recruited. I mean, I, I've got a letter just yesterday from a constituent, uh, and this is a, a late young woman of 18, she's got all the qualifications you would need to get into medical school, and she's been turned down. Um, and it seems to me, you know, with 1,372 applications, presumably all of those had to have the minimum entry requirement, or they, well, they wouldn't be treated as presumably as an application, of which only 192 offers, of which only 115. So from 1,372 applications, we end up with 115 of an intake. Now, we can't go on like that, but we're, we're always going to have a doctor shortage unless we train far more doctors. Now, I understand, obviously, you know, if you take the GP, the percentage who want to become GPs, it's difficult to fill the, the training post, for, and Tim referred to some of the reasons for that that need to be addressed. But we will continue to have overall shortages if we don't recruit many more people into medical school. I mean, we all know that uh, domiciled... Uh, applicants from Scotland are much more likely eventually to practice in Scotland in the same way that people who are from rural areas are much more likely to go back and practice, not necessarily in the rural area where they came from, but in a rural area. So, Caroline, do we not really need to do much more? I know we've increased the intake by 100 recently, I think. I don't know if that's this year or next year. But it seems to me that we need to go a lot further if we are going to get the pipeline of undergraduates and graduates that we need for tomorrow's world. Yeah, if I can make an, a, a number of comments in response to that. So I think, first thing, your point about the data is really well made. And I think um, the Auditor General uh, suggested that it would be helpful if if we were able in health to track that data. So within NES, we already index every um, undergraduate student who starts on a nursing course. We've done that for years, and that's proved incredibly useful in, in, in being able to track attrition, completions, and indeed being able to then see where those, where those graduates go in terms of employment. And we would really welcome an opportunity to do exactly the same around medical undergraduates as well. So that's the first point, because I think it is really important that we're able to track these folk through and see exactly where they go. I hope so, yes. We're working with Scottish Government and others on that. So Well, I mean, it surely should be treated as a matter of urgency because if we can, you know, how can we, how can we do workforce planning if we don't have the basic raw data required to do it? I, I agree, and that's what I was saying earlier about needing to identify the data that we don't have and to, and to make sure that we're able to get that data. So that, that is absolutely part of the work plan. The second thing I'd say is that, yes, we are clear that um, it, it, it does. The evidence does seem to indicate that we are more likely to retain uh, doctors in Scotland if they came from Scotland in the first place. 
Uh, I think we need to be careful with some of the da data because there is obviously a difference between applications and applicants because applicants will make multiple applications. So that will explain some of the reason why app why offers are not being accepted because those applicants will have made applications to more than one institution, possibly in Scotland, possibly outside of Scotland. But I do think that there is a that, that there is a real focus, and indeed Scottish government has a real focus on trying to increase the number of uh, stu of, of of graduates who stay in Scotland and also in trying to widen access to medical school places and indeed in trying to encourage uh, our undergraduates to think about general practice as a career. Uh, so you're right that the number of uh, places under, in, in undergraduate medical schools has been increased. So there was an increase of 50 in, I think, two, for, for I think intake 2016. There's also been the establishment of the Scott Gem, the, the Graduate School for Medicine, which is absolutely focused on both general practice and indeed attracting students from a, a wider access background. That will take its first intake of 40 in 2018. And Scottish Government has recently written to all universities asking them to submit proposals that would help to fulfil those strategic objectives of retaining more doctors in Scotland and indeed attractive, attracting more um, doctors into general practice. And, and they're looking to put between 50 and 100 extra undergraduate places into the system around that, which would be very welcome too. Can I just add in? To that, I mean, I think we need to see, and I think we do see, uh, university medical schools as key partners in, in, in this work, and I fully support what Caroline has said, and I think it goes more locally as well. Um, so I, I think the, the, there's evidence if you uh, grow up in an area, you go to a medical school within the area, you're more likely to stay within that, that medical school. And I think the widening access programme that we've seen with our, our local university in Aberdeen is seeing some 20 people coming through to that who would not have gone into medical degrees uh, otherwise. And I think that's hugely encouraging. So uh, you, you know, I think the local element of, of all of this and the university and the local health and social care system working hand in glove and drawing people out of the local population who've got the ability to do uh, medicine and really supporting them through a, a medical degree. And they might have thought, you know, I'm, I, it's not something I'd want to do or I, I'd have an expectation to do, but to create that expectation into them, to really support them, get them through the medical degree, they're going to be more likely to stay both within Scotland and, and, and locally as well. So I, I fully I support what Caroline the said. The other missing data is in relation to dropout rates. I mean, I know at one time we had a real problem with dropout rates with nurses. I think at 35%, and it's much, much less now. I think it's substantially down. Year on year, yeah. yes. And what is it now? Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember, but I can get you that information. Yes. But I mean, we don't know what the dropout rate is for medical students after second year. Sorry, Tim. You, you mentioned Edinburgh University, and I just thought you know we should um, make one or two points specifically about how we're trying to make the link between all these multiplicity of local individual plans and then coming together. A number of us were recently involved in a meeting with government and with all of the universities in Scotland looking at how we do, in fact, increase not just the number of uh, student places in Scotland, but particularly the Scottish domiciled uh, students who are more likely uh, to, to stay. And th those figures that you're referring to, the, you know, the, for Edinburgh University, the 1,300 and whatever applicants, Caroline's point's really important here that candidates are applying for a minimum of four places and so however many applicants there are that is probably divided by four in terms of the number of individuals so the actual number of Scottish applicants and the actual number of Scottish officers offers is actually very close and the Scottish numbers applying are actually falling at the moment and so therefore actually the relationship between Scottish domiciled applicants and offers is very very high but the numbers of places are controlled by government and so the fact that um, you, I think you mentioned Edinburgh University only offered 115 places I mean they're only allowed to offer 115 places to uh, Scottish domiciled uh, sorry to um, home home student places so at the moment, the, the numbers and the proportions of uh, rest of world, uh, uh, rest of UK, um, um, 
um, Scottish drummer cell, etc., is is set. So the the point I was making earlier in response to Mr. Kerr is at the moment universities have their plans, uh, government has had long term plans, health boards have had short term operational plans. We are absolutely wedded now to trying to pull this whole thing together so that the whole thing does align. But the problem is that. Because we have currently a very broadly similar number of Scottish domiciled applicants and offers, we need to grow the potential pool of applicants from Scotland. And that includes, for example, work with the most disadvantaged communities. So Edinburgh University in 2017 offered 30 places. So 30 of their 115 places came from the two most deprived quintiles of the Scottish school population. And that's a, it just gives an indication of how you know, the, the, this uh, uh, endeavour to expand the number but also expand the, the pool within which the universities are fishing for candidates for medical school is improving. So when you say the, there's 860 U, through UCAS, um, I mean, in my day, you could apply directly to the universities or you, through UCAS or both. Um, so... Uh, is that the total number, or is that just the number through UCAS? Uh, it is my understanding that all applications now go through UCAS. Right. Um, I think the figure we quoted, I need to check, but I think the figure, figure we quoted was first-time applicants, so there will be also some applicants who are applying for the second time. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was the first-time figure. Yeah. But clearly, we have a job to do. I mean, part of it sometimes is that supply can create demand in itself if you increase the number of places that can generate more demand as well because i think some people are just put off because they think their chances of getting in are, are so low yeah. and that's an interesting point because we now have the data from the uh, 2018 applic application cycle which shows that there were 920 applicants from scotland uh, applying in the 2018 for the 2018 entry so that that would indicate positive movement, yeah, yes. Right. Okay, and maybe we need to do a bit more. It's the construction sector, trying to get young people to go into the construction sector is, is very difficult because of the image it has. Obviously, we have a lot more work to do in the schools to try and get these bright pupils to, to apply for medical school. Can I just finish up by just one question on a completely related but different subject? Um, and that is the impact of the pension changes. Um, in 2010... Um, and for a lot of people listening out there, um, this is a lot of money. But in 2010, I think I'm right in saying you could build up a private pension fund tax-free of £1.8 million, pounds, a lifetime allowance. And after a number of changes, it is now down to £1 million. Now, the, you can put 40,000, maximum £40,000 a year into a pension fund tax-free. So... It doesn't take a lot to work out that that's 25 years of maximum pension contribution and you've reached your lifetime allowance. Now, certainly from talking to my own GP and from talking to numerous GPs in Ayrshire when I went down to meet them and talking to many other GPs across the country, uh, although they don't make a big issue of this publicly, privately, they're telling me they're retiring early because the pain or because of these pension changes uh, and what a number of them are doing is they're retiring on the friday on the monday they collect their pension uh, not the state pension but the their private pension uh, and then uh, they maybe do a couple of days being a locum so a lot of these people say retire now at 55 56 who previously would have probably carried on until 65 ish certainly into the 60s we get them for two days at 180% of the cost of what it would be the previous week to employ them, roughly. Uh, we then have to employ locums for the other three days because the original GP isn't there at 180% of the average cost of a GP under a normal contract. So um, we're not in charge of pension policy. You're not in charge of pension policy. None of us were consulted. The consequences of these changes were never properly examined. But we know from talking to GPs, one consequence is what I've described, early retirement, and we're losing a lot of GPs who otherwise would have been happy to work on but don't see the point. And indeed, I remember in Glasgow, Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, when the third change was made that year, 
the availability of GPs for out of our services went down by 40%. And when you spoke to a number of the GPs in their 30s and 40s, they said, well, what's the point of doing out of hours? It just means they'll need to retire at 52 instead of 55. So what can we do about it? For example, have, ha, has, has the Nash, have you looked at... You know, I mean, we're in the middle of a GP contract negotiations. It seems to me one of the things we should be looking at to see if it's possible, if whether GPs can go on to some kind of pension scheme similar to employees in pension schemes in the National Health Service, a superannuation scheme that doesn't have necessarily the same limitations or to the same extent. Those are, I mean, those are HMRC rules. They apply, you know, whoever the employer is, whether you're in the public sector, the private sector, but, you know, but, whatever. I'm, I mean. I'm, I'm, I'm just asking the question, you know, we, do we not need to look at, uh, is there something we can do to deal with the consequences of these changes? Because clearly they are one of the reasons why, not the only reason, but they're one of the reasons why we have this increasing shortage, it would appear, of GPs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can I come in on the, on the back of that? I mean, I, I don't have data on that, but like you, I speak to a number of doctors and I know that, that that is an issue. And I think it's actually a really good example about the limitations of workforce planning because things can happen like changes in, to taxes on, on pensions that actually have a profound impact on individuals and what they make decisions about in terms of their, their future that um, is actually out of our control. It's, it's not within the control of, 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 of Scotland and, and, and that happens. Um, I think an, an, another example of that, and we, again we've led it within the evidence, is the changes to permit-free training that in 2006. And my understanding is that we went from some, some 4,000 doctors who were coming from the Indian subcontinent uh, to about 400. Um, now that's the sort of thing that you can't predict within a workforce plan, and it happens, and you need to sort of adapt to that. So I guess part of that is, well, how can we incentivize doctors to continue in their careers, what what is it that would, you know, make it good for them to continue to uh, offer their, their their service? Because at the age of sixty, you know, many of them at the prime of their careers, they're very very experienced. They're really good diagnosticians, and and actually losing them from the national health services is a major loss. So what can we do to, um, you know, help them to continue to work? As well, I mean, again, there's a sort of short, medium, and long-term uh, view of this. So I think, just like you and like uh, like like Malcolm, I think anecdotally that that is the view that people have decided that it's no longer worth working. They've reached their annual uh, limit, uh, their lifetime allowance, and they uh, they take their retirement. So, I mean, obviously, um, over time, as the younger workforce then matures, you know, then uh, as I was saying earlier, the normal retirement age will be 68 for NHS staff, and I think people will be expecting and sort of calibrating their working careers based on not getting their occupational pension or their state pension until they're at the moment, say, 67 or 68. So I think in the sort of medium to long term, that will change. It's also, I'll come back to doctors in a second, but it's also, of course, the short, medium and long term issues around nursing. So we still have a generation of nurses who, when they were employed 30 or 40 years ago, could well, 30 years ago, could retire at the age of 55, or mental health officers who have mental health officer status who could retire at the age of 50. Um, and we're seeing that sort of spike of that generation getting to that age beyond 50 and towards 55. And of course, they are taking retirement. The new generation of nurses coming on will be on a different set of terms and conditions. We no longer have the mental health officer status. We no longer have the special classes of early retirement. So we've got a, a kind of an, a, an interim period as the as, as my generation comes towards their, their mid to late 50s and then the younger generation coming forward. So the short to medium term around that generation, unfortunately, as unpalatable as it might seem, is we have to get these people back beyond retirement. We have to have a plan that says take Matthew, your retirement and your come plan? back. Yeah, well, that is so. So we are doing return to practice. We yeah. are trying to be as flexible as we can be. And if someone is saying we, I, I'm going to take my pension. So if you don't allow me to come back to work, that's fine. I'm still leaving and I'm taking my pension. If you want me to come back and work, then I'm willing to come back perhaps part time. So increasingly across medical staff and nursing staff, we are for the I think for the next probably decade until that generational thing changes, as I've described we're going to have to be encouraging them, even more so, to come back to work. 
Tim, in what percentage are actually returning to work, even if it is part-time? I, I don't, but we, we have an increasing return to work uh, number, definitely. Right. Yeah. Can, can we get some figures on that, if you've got them? Please. I, I can give you numbers on total nurses. Um, we had three, we've got 364 on, have started on programmes, and of those, 246 have completed and are um, in, in moving into employment. But I can't tell you where, at what stage in their, their career those were. They may well have been I'm, people I'm who took time out for I'm other reasons. I'm particularly interested, for the purpose of this discussion, on GPs uh, who have retired and returned to work or not returned to work, and is it part-time but that, those numbers will be very difficult to get for us because, of right. course, the vast majority are independent contractors. They're, but, they're but, not centrally reported figures. But surely figures. for doing workforce planning, that information should be getting collected. Well, it currently isn't. Well, should we not rectify that then? Um, well, yes, possibly. But, I mean, at the moment, you know, independent contractors um, do their own workforce. Yeah, but they're contractors to the health service. Yeah. So if I... Yes, if indeed. I, but not, know, not as individuals. They're, they're contracted for our practice. Yes, but, mm -hmm. but surely we can ask the practice for the for the information. Cause we can ask, we need yeah. to, we, uh, As the Auditor General said, we need a far better grip on the data uh, around GP practices. And it seems to me this is a pretty important bit of data that we yes, should it, be collecting. Yes, it is. And I, I, I think that the, the data is an important. And as Tim says, they are independent practices. And I don't think they're under any obligation to disclose that data. However, it will be. Okay, however, through, through the integration joint boards, I mean, w we have a pretty good um, sense of where our practices are, where, who, who is planning to retire, who will be coming back within practice. And I think aggregating all of that to look at the trends that we've, we've got here and to say that there are a whole set of national trends that you know GPs and, and consultants are making these decisions uh, because of the pension rules and what is it we can do nationally to give greater incentives to keep them in practice. But, but I think, and you know, I think if you look at the Auditor General's report last week, that this is the kind of information on GP practices that absolutely needs to be systematically collected. And, you know, I, I realise under the existing contract there's not a contractual obligation. That doesn't stop us asking for it. Uh, and, and some may give it and some may not, but at least if you get enough of a return to see what the trends are, that helps. But I hope in the new contract there is an obligation to provide the required data because we can't get through another 10 or 15 years without getting the data we need from GP practices. Otherwise, what, workforce planning and that whole chunk of the health service will be meaningless. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just before I move to Monica Lennon, uh, Tim Davidson uh, and Alex Neal both talked about pulling it all together. Are you able to tell us who has the ownership of pulling it all together? Yeah, well, I think fundamentally Scottish Government, but increasingly we are working um, uh, towards that aspiration in a more collective way, as I was saying earlier. So before the Scottish Government had the policy imperatives around the long-term planning and the, the undergraduate numbers, the training numbers, etc., and boards really were focused on short-term operational delivery plans of perhaps only one year and uh, looking forward, or perhaps two or three years. But as we were saying earlier, you know, our plans really need to be a minimum of 15 to 20 if we're talking about medical workforce. So our our um, the way in which we're working now is the Scottish Government increasingly working with the three regions, increasingly working with their constituent health boards and IGBs. So it is, and, and partners, so as I said earlier, councils and universities. But ultimately, the Auditor General has challenged the Government to come up with our workforce plan for health and social care in Scotland, and it'll be the Government's responsibility to pull it together. Okay, so just and to we be, will be absolutely clear, to that. If, if I'm sitting here in three years' time and we're having a similar conversation, it will be a failing of the Scottish Government who has ownership. Is that what you're saying? Well, you're putting words in my mouth. I said earlier, no, I'm asking. I, I said, yeah, so my, my response would be we have a collective responsibility, all of us as accountable officers within the NHS, to work together. But the responsibility for pulling it together is the government's, absolutely. Monica Lennon. Thank you. If I can stick with Tim Davidson um, for the moment. Um, Tim, you did say that collectively health boards and the Scottish government have failed to coordinate sufficiently. Can I just keep the focus right now on, on patients and ask all of you just to explain uh, in terms that the public can understand what consequence does that have for patients now and going forward if we don't start to get this right? Well, 
perhaps, perhaps the, the immediate one perhaps would be around the failure to recruit to GP vacancies. And so what that leads to is, um, for example, um, GP practices not being able to register uh, new residents arriving in an area. We have that as a significant pressure in Edinburgh. Um, so we have restricted lists, for example, where um, family members, so if a family has a child, the child will be registered, but someone coming new into the area is not registered and the health board has to reallocate that person, perhaps to a practice not immediately within their you know, immediate locale. So that's, that's uh, one implication. Another is where GP practices fail and collapse because they can't recruit uh, to staff. And so we have to, health boards then have to stand in and, um, and directly manage those practices. And that's been a uh, an increasing phenomenon across Scotland. In, in my own patch in Lothian, we've had um, over the last five years an increase in that from um, perhaps two or three practices failing in a year to perhaps seven or eight practices failing in a year. Now, the, the population context is important here. So at the moment, um, when a health board steps in to recover a failed practice because they've been unable to recruit to vacancies, normally retirements or people leaving or maternity leaves or whatever, um, uh, then we have to step in and we have to create a uh, what's known as a 2C contract where we directly employ the staff and run the practice as though it was a directly employed bit of the NHS and uh, our latest data for this current year is that the number of practices that we have to being directly managed as a consequence of GPs uh, practices not being able to recruit represents about five percent of our patient population now on the on the other hand the very reason that we've stepped in is to make sure that those practices then continue to provide services. So for patients, they shouldn't see an ongoing impact beyond the short-term disruption that often is the case. But that, those are two examples. The, the, the third example, I suppose I would quote, is the uh, significant increase in uh, waiting times for elective services, which is a, as a consequence of um, not being able to recruit sufficient uh, numbers and and there are real hot spots there um you know so for example and, and that uh, sometimes is not a failure of workforce planning it's the um coming together of a range of perhaps difficult to predict issues like in a team of in my case uh, urology at the western general currently i mean my medical workforce vacancy rate in lothian across the piece is about five percent just under five percent actually 4.8 percent but in particular specialties on particular hospital sites because of for example maternity leave Leave, genuine long-term sickness absence or vacancies um, we have uh, a vacancy rate of something like 27 percent in in that specific specialty and so where that happens urgent cases and cancer cases for example are prioritized and routine cases are uh, prioritized at a lower level and therefore patients wait longer so those are the sorts of things but I mean in all of those cases as I'm hoping ex I'm expressing to you you have a huge responsibility and an ability to step in and mitigate the impact of that mm -hmm. So if we look at where GP practices fail and collapse and the health board has to step in, I think you've explained that the service continues, but is that sustainable and, and what impact does that have on NHS boards as a whole? It's a lot of pressure to absorb. Well, increasingly, I think the resilience of practices will be based on, um, on bigger population sizes. So generally where practices fail, it's where they're relatively small, either single-handed practices or perhaps two or three doctors working in a practice. And generally speaking, my personal view is that the resilience of a practice is greater if there's a bigger uh, practice population with a bigger number of uh, GPs working in it and that is not only resilient in terms of being able to cope with for example um, you know you can imagine a single-handed practice with one maternity leave is 100% deficit so um, but also I think that when I said earlier about how onerous uh, the work is. I think bigger practices generally allow a better spread of uh, how onerous the tasks are, you know, particularly when we're offering early morning opening, late evening opening, you know, that kind of thing. So I think the, I think the answer, at least part of the answer, is to encourage what we're beginning to see, which is practices merging, practices, uh, neighbouring practices taking over uh, failed practices and merging the practices, and I think that's a significant part of the solution. That sort of solution can work well in a inner city environment or in, in large towns and settlements, but I think once we get out to 
remote and rural areas of Scotland where you know peripherality is a, is a, is a major issue and you've got single-handed practices or very small practices and then you have you know one GP who takes decisions you know legitimately to retire then you know suddenly you've got some real problems on your hands and I come back to the point about adaptability and I think it's the board's responsibilities and I think we, we do this to get close to practices to keep in touch with them and to diversify the workforce within the practices so it's not completely dependent on individual GPs so might what might work in a large urban area will definitely not work in a in a remote and rural area so I think the solutions need to be different and I think, I think that point about working uh, with GP practices uh, early on at the first sign that they're feeling under pressure or there's there's a, a, a uh, a risk factor, a vulnerability. Uh, what we've been doing in Ayrshire is, is working with them to try and support them to continue. Um, and, and, and clearly where that doesn't happen, then we step in, uh, increasingly using multidisciplinary teams, increasingly using uh, skills of pharmacy, physiotherapists to enhance uh, and support uh, that practice in terms of meeting the needs of the population. So you know, early engagement with them is very, very important. One of the things that, that came across in, in the, the earlier um, Q&A was that um, there isn't a lack of, of leaders uh, at the top of the NHS or, or indeed the government, but it sounds like there's a lack of leadership. Um, this is really important. It's, you know, you're all in the hot seat today, but it's not about pointing fingers. We're all looking for ways to improve. What would your message be today to, to other colleagues, to people who are listening in and people who will be reading this official report afterwards because we'll probably take further evidence you know what what can colleagues do what can people who are passionate about the NHS do to to work differently to achieve you know shared outcomes I think one message would, would be that we are completely committed to the National Health Service in Scotland to a sustainable workforce within the NHS in Scotland uh, and I think about giving that leadership that is alongside clinicians, alongside GPs, alongside consultants, alongside nurses, diversifying the workforce, supporting the workforce, making sure the workforce is trained, you know, and recognising the challenging situation that we're heading into, you know, financially. We're not going to be able to expand the numbers within the NHS workforce uh, significantly. So I think it is about support, it's about training, and it's about diversification. And, uh, and also, I think, to say that workforce planning is really important, you know, particularly for the um, the undergraduate and postgraduate numbers. But I actually think flexibility and adaptability. Workforce planning can only take us so far. It'll get us to a point, but we know there'll be things coming across the barriers that cannot be predicted and won't be predicted. And I actually think the combination of the work that Caroline's describing and what we do at a very local level to support practitioners, I, you know, I, I hope we would all agree that our role is to lead that change and to support and encourage our staff in doing so. And I, and I think what I'm seeing is uh, a, a, a actually a strength of leadership across the NHS, um, across all the professions, uh, some very strong clinical leadership coming forward. Uh, I think looking at the opportunities, recognising the need to, to adapt and to, to change uh, perhaps how we do things and to look at workforce differently, I think we've come a long way. Um, and professions have, have uh, worked to help evolve and change some of that. So I, I think that people are uh, in leadership roles and beyond, uh, because that many people are in, in different types of leadership role, are, are beginning to, to coalesce around this, this work and see the importance of it. Uh, and I'm encouraged by that. Also, I think there is a reality that from the figures that we saw about the growing, uh, our population is growing, the older population is growing, our working age population is reducing, and our real terms funding is declining. So that reality means that even that, I think, will only take us so far. And so some of the things we talked about earlier, about I mean, Mr. Neil mentioned, for example, you know, the introduction of new technology. I think robotics, artificial intelligence, new technology, alternatives to traditional workforce models. I mean, there was a, you know, a media report just a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, somewhere south of the border, where, for example, using um, uh, digital reminders for um, uh, medicines compliance for people living at home, for example, rather than a home visit from a carer to uh, support 
support medicines compliance, all of that, and, so, and probably a whole raft of things that we haven't even thought of yet, has to be in addition to all of the flexible workforce requirements. Because the, the arithmetic just doesn't stack up. The working age population is not growing in pace with our overall population. So we, we need to have workforce solutions, but we also need, need to have uh, uh, supplements to, uh, to people. Uh, and again, not to uh, just to add to what my colleagues have said, I think one of the changes that we are starting to see is people working together much better. So I think even in the short time that the regions have been established and also the national boards coming to, to work together, we have seen a change in what we're able to achieve and the pace of that as well. And that's about bringing us together collectively, people who understand, so the IJBs who understand the, the, the particular circumstances in their localities and then um, pulling that together with health boards and in increasing into the regions, I think that collaborative working is absolutely crucial in terms of us getting to a better place around all this. I think there's been a step change in that collaborative working across board boundaries, certainly within the north of Scotland. And I've had colleagues describing it as a, as a sea change in, in, in difference of, of, of attitudes. So if you take um, a hospital like Dr. Gray's in Elgin, uh, and there's been some well-publicised you know, staffing challenges there. Um, a, a real recognition that part of the solution is not just working with Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, but it's working across the health board boundary into Raid Moor and, and Inverness. And there are very active discussions going on now at, at a rate that would not have happened six or nine months ago. So I think that whole move towards seeing things in a regional dimension as well as an individual health board dimension, that is really starting to gain some currency. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's good to see some, some cultural change happening. Some of my um, colleagues, I think both on the right and left here, have, have better business brains than I do. And I guess there's a lot the public and private sector can learn from one another. But this isn't a business with shareholders and customers. This is a public service. It is our beloved NHS. And Patients, frankly, don't have anywhere else to go unless, of course, they can afford extortionate private health care. And I know that in some cases, constituents of ours are having to beg, steal and borrow because they're desperate, because they have been on waiting lists for, for 12 months and longer. And there was a health debate in Parliament yesterday, and, and Jackie Bailey, our convener, isn't here today, but she read out a, a long list of her constituents um, who have been waiting for knee operations and, and other types of treatment for, for longer than a year. Shona Robinson, the health secretary, you know, she said it's not good enough. She was, you know, she's quite angry about that. But we're all getting constituents through the door. We're getting emails. We're getting real stories of distress. Is there a point in which we have to say to constituents that there's an inevitability about some of this? Well, I think there's an inevitability of trying to r reconcile the policy imperatives that we have. And so what we are trying to juggle, um, whether we're wearing our health board hats or our regional hats, are, so we have a statutory duty to live within the resources available, and those resources are now declining in real terms, as the Auditor General's report uh, says. So we have that statutory duty. We also have a statutory duty to... Uh, shift the balance of care and support and improve primary care. We've talked a lot about GPs, for example. And we also have to improve our deteriorating performance on waiting times. Now, at the moment, those three things can appear apparently quite difficult to reconcile. So we have to save the most significant amount of cash we've ever been challenged to do. Um, and so whether that's 4 or 5% a year, on a sustainable recurring basis of cash savings that have to come out of the system in order to cover the fact that our costs are growing faster than our inflationary uplift. So whether that's to fund drug inflation, acute drugs at 8% a year, GP drugs at 4% 4, 4 a year. So at the moment, it is looking extremely difficult to reconcile saving 5% recurringly a year why, in order to fund demographic pressures and prescribing growth, for example, and improve access to elective targets and improve uh, uh, resource uh, allocations to primary care. And, you know, frankly, I think the, uh, the issue about um, bigger macroeconomic policy uh, issues for both this parliament and uh, the UK parliament around 
um, the, the responsibilities of citizen and state, uh, issues around uh, uh, income tax, for example, are really important here. I think what's becoming clear to us, and I think the challenge the Auditor General lays down to us, is that we now have to reconcile that in our plans. So our regional plans that we are developing and the national boards are developing their equivalent of the regional plans and, and, and national board plan, and all of those plans then come together with government, we'll have a regional plan. We will address the challenge laid down by the Auditor General, which is that we need your service plans to be reconciled with your financial plans, to be reconciled with your workforce plans. Now, if as a consequence of that we say our view of the workforce we need is neither available nor affordable, if that's what we say, then that generates a whole different conversation about how we're going to respond to that, both at a political level and at a, at a service delivery level. And when I was referring to Mr Kerr about us not having a plan, that's really what I was meaning. There is currently not a published plan that reconciles our service aspirations, our financial uh, requirements, um, and our workforce requirements, and we need to pull that together. I was involved in a, a different kind of planning before I came to Parliament. I'm a town planner, and um, I would never say that you can have too much planning or, or too many plans, but that point that you've just made, I mean, before you can start to develop a plan, you need to have a real vision of what it is you're trying to achieve. Is there clarity around the vision? I think there's clarity around the vision. I think the lack of clarity is about how we get there, over what time scale and how much it costs. And w if I go back to one thing that uh, Alex Neil was saying about, you know, can we not do this in 12 months? I think if it was simply a question of saying how many more, you know, if our elderly population is going to grow by 40% in the next 10 years, what does that mean for how many more GPs, how many more district nurses, how many more, you know, whatever, and we would say we need 20 of those and 40 of those and 100 of those, and that's another 50 million, thanks very much. But the reality is that, we're, we're not going to have, as we're saying in the short to medium term, the next five or ten years, we're not going to have 40 more GPs or 40 more geriatricians, nor are we going to have the resource in the short term to pay for it. So where I think the 12 months challenge that Mr Neil was putting down is extremely challenging is, so the alternative plan hasn't been invented yet. And that is what integration authorities are about. That is what the regional plans are about. That is what the, the need for innovation is about, is we've got to come up with solutions that, frankly, haven't been invented yet, not just in Scotland, I might add, but across the Western world. All of these... Pre this is not a uniquely Scottish problem. Yeah, I mean, if I can open this up to the rest of the panel, um, in previous sessions, um, particularly when we've looked at health and social care integration, you know, we've been reassured that the integration isn't new, that people in the NHS and in local government have been doing this for quite a long time, but the boards themselves, you know, they are a, a relatively new creation. So previously, well, you know, I've taken comfort that um, this type of collaborative working um, isn't new and that we aren't stand, starting from a, a sort of standing start. So, but is it, you know, because I feel like we are getting mixed messages. In terms of the, the integration, integration joint boards, I think it, you know it's true to say that we've always worked together across health and social care, and we've had various initiatives over the years. I think the IJBs take this to a new level, um, and and certainly from my local patch, I think that changes that have been made and say reducing the number of delayed discharges from uh, acute hospitals I think that th th they've been halved in, in, in the space of about 18 months or so and, and I put a lot of that down to um, the relationship between the board chief exec, the local authority chief exec, the appointment of good chief officers and then working together collaboratively to make sure that we make those changes to where, where patients are cared for so we don't have patients staying in hospital who shouldn't be staying in hospital and also making sure that IJBs aren't you know doing things that um, you know cr create a negative effect within so you know very much looking at the whole system so I think we are seeing changes in, in terms of occupied bed days for unscheduled care uh, across Aberdeen City across Aberdeen Shire and across Murray and, and I think that's all good um, I think the challenge that Tim's talking about in terms of elective care, I think that that's a, a very significant challenge at the moment in terms of um, 
people waiting for outpatient appointments, people waiting for hips and knees and cataracts and, and, and all of those conditions. And I think when, you know, to take Mr. Neil's point, looking at the population profile and the morbidity profile that we can predict into the future, that is going to be a, a real challenge. So I guess, you know, one of the things that, you know, concerns me as, a, as an accountable officer is just the ability to care for that for that population and making sure that those people get their operations when they actually need to get them. Okay. We've been working in partnership and collaboratively for, for, for many years and, and, and beyond just health and social care, much, much uh, uh, more widely in our communities. From an Ayrshire uh, context, then uh, the uh, introduction of integrated joint boards um, has, I think, created a much stronger local and community focus uh, in, in, in terms of our planning and in terms of, of how we look to shape services. And I think it's allowed us to have uh, stronger partnership links and, and collaborative links with um, education, third sector, uh, and, and, and other uh, uh, parties. So I think it has uh, been uh, had in those, and it's, it's still very much fledgling in, in terms of its, its, uh, its, its life. But I think we have seen change. Um, but as, as we have said throughout the discussion this morning, um, we need to make sure that we continue to join up uh, that planning at locality level, because there's a strength in planning at locality level. Um, but making sure that joins the whole system across the board and where it should then make those links into regional uh, delivery planning, that we make those links um, across all aspects of service planning, workforce and, and resourcing. But I think it's a very, uh, in Ayrshire, it's been a very positive uh, development. In your joint submission for the committee today, uh, you addressed the, the matter of affordability of plans and again it doesn't look like a, an easy task um, so we understand that boards are required to deliver affordable workforce plans but you're suggesting to us that you've got a situation of limited information on the future funding that you're going to receive alongside the Scottish Government requiring um, you to provide workforce projections for three years um, so again, this this seems to be quite tricky. How challenging is that on a, a scale of one to ten? Ten being very tricky. I think it's very challenging because this is a very complex. Um, uh, you know, this isn't a linear arithmetic proposition. We are trying to look at so many variables and factors. I think what we have to be uh, clear about when we develop these plans is what assumptions we've made. Um, and we need to understand and, and bring our best intelligence to uh, what that environment and those environmental factors are, whether it's finance, whether it's uh, uh, changes in technology. Um, and as long as we're clear on those assumptions, and, and, and we're going to have to, to take, I think, some, some risks in terms of developing these plans, because as we have said, I think, uh, on a number of occasions this morning, uh, some of what we need is, a, is a, a, an adaptable and, and different uh, set of skills within our workforce. So we do need to start to train for some of those. Um, and so we need to make some, you know, carefully considered assumptions, but assumptions nonetheless, if we're going to be able to look beyond that one year horizon, which I think is very important. Do have the tools to do that, to um, take that as an informed approach to risk? I, 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 well, I think it's not new. We do that. That is, that is part of what we do. Um, there is no doubt from what, what uh, we, we've, we've uh, heard this morning that you know, some of the developments around workforce planning tools and data and so that come forward will assist significantly in that process. But I think we, we have got uh, you know, people in our, our teams and in our boards um, who have an understanding and an expertise. Uh, they're small in number around workforce planning. Um, and, and the fact that we have already made, I think, some important shifts and changes demonstrates that we can make some of those uh, assumptions. But what I think we need to be is perhaps uh, bolder in terms of looking beyond that shorter horizon into some of those longer horizons. I think if we accept that 
the, the premise that I think the Auditor General was w was making that we're not going to be able to significantly in increase the, the NHS and social care workforce numerically. And if we also accept the proposition that the, the, the training pipeline, particularly for medical staff, is, is very, very long. So whatever decisions we make today, the world will be completely different by the time they graduate. They'll be completely different by the time they finish their postgraduate education. But if we look at it from the point of view, we have a workforce, and actually what we need is a workforce that is adaptable, that can be trained, that can be developed. So it's not about just producing a practitioner who can do that, and, and, and that's it. We produce practitioners who are flexible, adaptable, and are able to progress their careers. And the point I was making about the importance of partnerships with local universities and colleges of further education are absolutely critical. So you probably our closest partners in, in, in Grampian are the North East Scotland College, Robert Gordon's University and Aberdeen University, where we can have discussions with them, we can project our local workforce requirements and they can do the training and you know actually getting um, NESCOL and uh, Aberdeen University to work together, for example, in terms of getting people who may be interested in, say, nursing degrees and giving people the confidence and the numerical skills to do a nursing degree and then articulate them through Robert Gordon University or the Open University. There's lots of examples of all of that so that we actually take the, the workforce we've got and say, well, how can we develop them? And I think that's going to be the key to planning in the future as well as getting the high-level numbers right. I think it's the local adaptive action that's going to be really important. And I think, I think it's also mm -hmm. important that we've focused a lot this morning on medical and nursing. Um, we really need to look at the whole workforce and we need to look beyond health into health and social care. And we need to make uh, uh, sure that as we go forward, these professions and these jobs are valued. They're valued by society and they're valued for what they bring and offer to communities. So we need to make sure that, yes, absolutely a focus on medical nursing, but we need to make sure that's much broader uh, so that we have a sustainable workforce across the whole system that's there to support those other uh, disciplines. I had a final question, um, convener, but your point there about people fe feeling valued, I can't find exact statistic, but I think it's from the last staff survey, I think for 2015, am I right that it was over two out of ten people working in any given health board say that they intend to leave within 12 months? Is that partly due to people not feeling valued? Um, is it due to just lack of morale? What, what, what's your understanding of that? Well, we've, we've done, uh, as we will all be, uh, using the beyond the staff survey and using uh, iMatter. Uh, which gets right down into teams looking. Um, and, and in Ayrshire, we've had a very positive response to the, the I matter, uh, where teams are looking at you know, their value and how they work and, uh, and their roles, and, and, and then how they might look to their own local team improvement plans. So we've had a very high level uh, of uh, positive uh, staff engagement on the back of that, and I think that's a much more sensitive tool uh, in terms of uh, working with teams. Uh, so. Of course, there will be uh, challenges within staff. Staff are busy, uh, and staff will be feeling uh, the demands and pressures on on the system. But I think if we put the right uh, um, if we put the right uh, approach in around well-being and, and and supporting staff, then we can we can help to support and manage some of the concerns that staff staff rightly express. I would agree with that, and I think the I Matter tool is an evidence-based intervention that's been worked up ver very, very carefully. And certainly the results for NHS Grampian, you know, our most recent results show a 70% employee engagement index. So that is how well the employees are engaging with the organisation, you know, about commitment, about involvement uh, against a range of scores. And those scores have been going up over the last three years. And, and we've got just under 80% of staff saying they've got sufficient support to do their job well. That's good, but that also implies that there's 20% of people who don't. And we've got much lower scores about do we think we've got enough staff to do the, the job properly. Uh, so there are real concerns about you know the numbers of staff we've actually got. And I guess you know one of the major challenges of, of NHS Grampian is the supply of trained workforce, particularly around nursing workforce. And we're doing all the things that we've described. You know, return to practice programs. We've been hugely successful 
and we need to move that much, much f further forward. But I do think the thing that makes the difference is the leadership, is the engagement, and creating an environment where staff feel valued and supported and, and are really committed to their work. Um, and certainly from my point of view, that is certainly one of my top priorities, to create that sort of environment where people feel valued. Uh, and I think that the, the, the crucial difference about using the iMatter tool there is that it's not just about filling in the survey, it's then about having a conversation with the team and developing an action plan. So, so that is actually, I think, across boards across Scotland, actually re leading to real improvements in the way in which staff feel valued and engaged and are able to have those conversations about what improvements can be made to help them feel even more valued and engaged, and that's really important. Well, it's good to get an example of some planning working well. Can I just jump back to um, my last question on affordability? Um, really, for my own information, other colleagues might understand this better than, than me, but for medical workforce, it says that, in your statement, you say that boards um, only have to give a one-year projection. Uh, I don't understand the background to that, but given that you've pointed out that there's a training period of 15 years plus, what's, can, you, can you explain that? It seems a bit odd to me. Can I maybe just say that the, 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 it's not just the information that's in board workforce plans, it's used in terms of looking at the number of both undergraduate and postgraduate training grades. So over the last couple of years particularly, we've been uh, looking at medical um, training on a specialty by specialty basis. So that's very much looking at um, the actual profiles within that specialty. So uh, that will be around what the consultant population currently is, uh, how much we expect that to reduce through retirals over the next few years, and also looking at the training population, so how many trainees we're expecting to achieve completion, satisfactory completion of training, but also um, where we've got people going out of training for maternity leave or for, for to, so that we can actually factor in all those. So so there's actually quite a complex mechanism that now looks at uh, what, what we need in terms of uh, medical training in each specialty. And that is a little bit informed by board's workforce plans, but actually there's a much more sophisticated profiling goes on behind that. Thank you. Sophie. Thank you very much. Good morning to you. Um, I'd like to continue the discussion a wee bit on service redesign and perhaps give you an opportunity to, to summarise and give us your thoughts on this. Uh, but firstly, could I just jump back briefly to the university admissions issue that Alec Neil raised and ask you, Caroline, uh, the information that we have in front of us for the universities doesn't give us any information from St Andrews or Dundee medical schools, because it says here that that information isn't publicly available from those two institutions. Is there an explanation for that? The reason I ask you this is we covered this at, when I was on the Equalities Committee and we were looking at university admissions to medical schools from across the population and so on. So I'm wondering why we don't have data from them and can we get it? I think that's a question for the universities. Uh, the universities decide what information they make publicly available, and certainly I think it would be up to the committee to ask them to provide that data. Yeah, they, they certainly gave a commitment, as I understood it, during my time on the Equalities Committee to supply that. And related to that, Tim, you did mention that we're becoming more successful, I think, in getting undergraduates to enter, to, take, to go to medical school from across the population sectors. That was a key concern for that committee at that particular time. Yeah. And is that borne out? Is that, is that beginning to, to bear fruit for us, do you think? Well, I mean, I, 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 you know, the University of Edinburgh is on our board, as you know, the medical school, the head of the medical school is a non-executive director of our board. So we have very, um, you know, extremely close relationships with, it, with, with them. And we were talking with them just as recently as, as last evening. So the, the, the particular thing that I uh, referred to was a briefing from the head of the uh, dean that said, um, the proportion of Scottish school pupils from the two most disadvantaged quintiles who received an offer from Edinburgh University was 30 applicants. So I think that is a step in the right direction. The, the point I was making, I suppose, is that we need to further increase that. And also, there, there is an issue about some universities don't interview um, applicants. So it's an entire paper-based and academic qualification-led uh, sort of criteria for appointment. And the point I was trying to make earlier, probably clumsily, was that 
uh, increasingly, I think I would want to encourage universities to actually interview staff and uh, interview candidates for university to see if they have the aptitude to do the job that we require them to do. So we do require them, as I was saying earlier, to work 24-7 uh, rotors, even if they're working part-time and less intensively or whatever. We do require them to fill uh, GP roles. We do require them to work in rural and remote areas in, in, in Scotland. And, and I, I think, actually, the, the two things go hand in glove. If we broaden the scope of applicants, that would include broadening to remote and rural areas, for example. And I think I think there is, a, my, my hunch, it is just a hunch, but I, I think my hunch is that just as we believe that Scottish domiciled students are more likely to remain in Scotland, I think possibly remote and rural domiciled applicants would perhaps be more readily willing to go back to work in remote and rural areas. So I think, I think that's the kind of thing that, that uh, we are beginning to see some, and I think to be fair to Edinburgh University, and I'm sure the other universities are doing the same things, I think there's a, a real appetite to get into this now, in, in a way that I think Edinburgh are demonstrating. I'm encouraged by that, uh, but perhaps for you directly, Caroline, I think you said that the limitation in numbers is set by government and then take numbers. Has that changed over recent years, given what we know that GPs see their own futures, they see it perhaps more of short time, part time working, different lifestyle changes, different demands on them. So are we reflecting our numbers and our intake numbers based on that kind of performance from GPs? Hopefully? Yeah, so uh, the number of the intake to uh, undergraduate medical schools was increased by 50, I think for 2016 onwards. We've then seen Scottish Government have, are establishing a Scottish graduate entry medical school, which will have its first intake next year in 2018. And Scottish Government have also asked, uh, announced that there will be additional places focused on trying to retain more graduates in Scotland and also focused on trying to attract more people into GP training again um, from 2018. So we are seeing an expansion in undergraduate numbers, yes. Thanks for that. I, I wonder if I could just turn to the, the whole service redesign issue. I mean, I'm try, trying to be very positive about this. I mean, Scotland's NHS probably is the best performing in the UK. Patient satisfaction is the highest it's ever been. There's record investment, there's more GPs. Uh, there's about th nearly 3,000 more GPs than there were 10 years ago. Yet, the public perception uh, is that th th their expectation, perhaps, and their demand is it beginning to outs outstrip our ability to deliver even a really good service to the public. So, in the kind of broad context of service redesign, wh what are the key messages you could give to us and give to the public who may be listening to this kind of discussion? What kind of changes do we need to to make so that when we're perhaps again, as Liam said, if we're looking at this next year or even in five years, what would we expect to see that would begin to manage these expectations that the public may have of their NHS? The, the, biggest, the biggest single thing I think is about reducing demand. And, whether, and there are a variety of things for that. So if, if what we're saying is that our population is growing, our older population is growing, people are living long enough now to now live with multiple conditions people are now living long enough to get cancer and then live with cancer for uh, you know a long period because of advances in care and technology so if we're saying that's that's true and i think we are saying that is true more people more older people more people with longer term conditions all of which requiring medication care intervention etc and we're saying we think the working age population is reducing so therefore the workforce supply is not going to be keeping pace and we're saying that the money is looking pretty flat then the traditional response uh, of the last 20 years has been to throw more and more and more money at the health service and employ more and more and more staff to do things ever increasingly faster and faster and faster. So, you know, waiting times did used to be a maximum of 12 months, then it was a maximum of 26 weeks, then it was a maximum of 18 weeks, now it's a maximum of 12. You know, there's a sort of, there's a limit to how, how you know, um, that, that can continue. So I think the traditional response of saying, so let's respond to growing demand in the way that the health service always has, which is more cash, more staff is just not an option. And therefore, our endeavour has to be around shifting demand. So the sorts of things that we are doing, which I think you know are coherent, is, uh, for example, unnecessary interventions that don't add value. I think there's quite a, a lot of work around that. Uh, think the whole realistic medicine um, um, scenario around perhaps offering procedures because we can rather than because they actually will will lead to a, uh, an improvement in the patient's condition. Uh, demand for new medicines where the cost of new medicine vastly outstrips the 
very marginal population health uh, um, improvement as a consequence of that. Um, uh, people currently, you know, having to go to a GP in order to be referred to a podiatrist rather than just going straight to a podiatrist, you know, etc. I think, and th what I said earlier about self-management of conditions, you know, people actually, uh, whether that's using digital technology to help them, artificial intelligence, you know, everyone knows the Google doctor who will, you know, help help them with their condition, go, using community pharmacy rather than going to the GP to go on a waiting list for an outpatient, you know, referral, etc. So my my personal view of this is that uh, the new um, uh, focus for us all, whether that's politically service providers, patients and carers, etc., is how we manage demand on the health service down. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I would agree with, with uh, what Tim has said. I think that um, we do need to uh, think very carefully about how we're going to support citizens uh, you know differently um, uh, in in their their home um, and how we support uh, individuals with long-term conditions and I think the uh, technology going forward I think there's a lot more that we can do we've got some great examples um, but in small scale and and we need to be able to think about how we scale that but we need to also make sure that uh, citizens are confident to use uh, technology in the way that uh, uh, tests have shown can work very successfully. And indeed, I think doing that, and we've, we've seen examples in Ayrshire where, and I'm sure colleagues will have examples in, in their areas where it enhances the quality of an individual's life. They're not having to go to hospital three, four, five, six times for appointments. They're able to self-manage. They're able to, to work uh, and look after uh, uh, their their own uh, health uh, more effectively because of anticipated care planning um, and knowing what to do if uh, uh, they have an exacerbation of a condition. So I think technology is important. I think realistic medicine in terms of, I think that, that this has been a really important uh, uh, conversation that the chief medical officer has has uh, has started and, and realizing realistic medicine and engaging differently uh, with uh, clinicians and with patients. Uh, I think that will have a, a, an important part to play. But I think what we have to do at the heart of this is we need to um, in, we need to have a, a dialogue with our communities about how these are positive changes that that we can make and that they actually provide uh, added benefit, um, uh, added quality of life to the individual um, and, uh, by using new technologies and having, uh, and not needing to turn up at hospital as often or to beat your GP. And then that final point around the, the wider community resource, you know, being seen by the right person at the right time, uh, and that's not always the people we might traditionally think we need to see. Uh, and again, in, 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 in Ayrshire, we've been doing some uh, I think fairly good work around eye care services um, where we've been uh, redirecting uh, people from hospital, from general practice to the high street optical services with, with great success. Uh, so I think things like that are what we should see at the heart of redesign. Welcome, could I hear you? You as well, please. see a significant shift really from acute hospital care into care within communities uh, and in primary community care settings and I think what John was saying both about realistic medicine and I think that's about changing the conversation that clinicians have with patients and the notion that just because it can be done doesn't mean it's the best thing to do and helping you know, people really to have a, a full understanding of what the condition is what the choices are to them and with that better sense of dialogue they might just make some different choices around it I think the use of technology and and really developing local community capacity so um, you know, if you live in a remote com community and you need to see a consultant for an outpatient department if you're in one of the islands, then the amount of travel and overnight stays to get a short appointment with a consultant, you know, can we use Attend Anywhere software that NHS 24 has developed to make sure that if you actually don't need hands-on care or if it's a return outpatient appointment, you can actually have that done within your local community and using that kind of technology. So I think we're going to see much more of a shift into local communities 
communities, community re resilience, and then that team of multi, multi professional team of different practitioners who can work within the community to support people with slightly different expectations about what their pathways of care are going to be in the future. The point to make is that we also need to focus on prevention as well, and that clearly goes much, much more broadly than just looking at NHS Scotland. That's that's something for the whole of the public sector and indeed Scottish society. See, could I, can I share you with you an example? I mean, uh, this week in preparation for the, the meeting, I visited one of my local practices, and the lead practitioner there was telling me they get 2,000 visits a week, and they'll get 13,000 on their books. That means that everybody is coming to see their GP seven or eight times a year. That, this is not sustainable. And, and, and it's one of the main reasons why a lot of the GPs are feeling so stressed and so under pressure because of this huge volume of repeat visits by the patients. Now, the patients really value it. But I would suggest to you and colleagues that we cannot sustain that. So we have to take patients on this journey with us. <laughs> and reach out. It's a partnership. We, the, the health service is held in very high regard by them, but their expectations are huge and perhaps beyond, getting beyond their ability to, to deliver that. How do we reach out to the patients, these 13,000 or so patients, to, to say to them, you know, there are different ways. It's not a failure if you don't see your GP at your practice, but many of them think that it is. Oh, I want to see my GP or else. You know, there's, there's still an attitude a bit like that. There are so many specialisms in GP practices now, but have we failed to persuade the public that there is a better model there for, for their health care? Because at the minute, I don't feel that they feel that. They feel as though it's a failing that they can't see the person that they would wish to see in a particular day. I think, I think, I think. That's right. I think, we, I think we need to do more about communicating that this, the, the changes are, are for positive reasons. Um, and as so I used the example of eye care in Ayrshire, um, so instead of going to see your GP, go and see your, 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 your optician uh, in, in the high street. Um, and we have seen that shift um, of uh, um, behaviour, uh, people going to, to those services in Ayrshire. Um, it's been a pilot to begin with, but that has evolved very successfully. But I think we need to be uh, more explicit uh, I think our communication needs to be better. Um, and we need to be clear about why we're saying this. Not don't go and see your GP, but actually you'd be better to go and see this practitioner. So if you're referred to a nurse or a physiotherapist or another professional, then it's because we believe that's the right person to support you in, in your care needs. Uh, it's not that we're saying you shouldn't see a GP, uh, but it is that default position. And, and I think we just need to try and uh, engage more effectively with our communities. Um, and perhaps we need to, 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 to think about that uh, on a wider Scotland basis in terms of having some key messages about how uh, we, uh, our communities can, can work with us. Because I agree, it's a, it's a, it has to be a partnership. Yeah, I mean, the communication is, is fundamental to it. And I'm sure other members in the committee have had so many engagements with the constituents who don't really get the language that the NHS perhaps uses in, in its writing and communicating with them. And there is a de degree of suspicion with what they read, oh, they're trying to pass me off to this, pass me off. That's kind of the perception. We really need to, to improve and embrace that kind of direct engagement with the patients, that it is a better journey for them, but it's a kind of a whole health care model we're looking at for them. We're not just pushing them out the door because we're too busy and we're stressed. I, do, I feel we've got a lot to do in that area, and I would really appreciate if you would take that kind of message on board and see if we can improve that. Malcolm? I, I, I would very, very much agree with that, and I think this is something where local systems and government can really work hand in, in glove on it. And certainly one of the local things we started in winter planning a number of years ago was a, a Know Who to Turn To campaign, where we're communicating with the public about these are the different types of practitioners, and actually if you've got this, it's maybe better to go to a pharmacist, or this is what an, an opt optician can do, this is, this is what a dentist can do. And actually looking at the training 
that modern dentists have and optometrists have and pharmacists have, actually if you go in and have conversations with them, they've got the training to pick up things that maybe 10 years ago might not have been picked up and if they're working as part of a multi-professional team. So I think getting those messages over that it's not just about the GP, I think GPs bring a unique set of skills, but there's a whole range of professionals that you can work with. And I think for that messaging and narrative from government to support that, uh, I think would be really helpful. Do you get? I don't, I don't know what the European experience is, but do you get the impression that citizens in other jurisdictions are already having this kind of experience, where they they are moving around the health service and finding these different skills, that are, or are they relying on their GP in this traditional relationship with the one to one with their GP? Are things moving on in other jurisdictions? Do you think, and do we need to catch up a wee bit there? models you know i mean some european countries citizens go directly to secondary care directly to secondary care specialties and don't touch base with the gp so that's obviously a very fundamentally different system the thing i was saying earlier as well i mean in new zealand for example which is you know uh, in in many ways a similar kind of demography to uh, to scotland um citizens have to pay to go and see a gp you know p people pay i think it's 30 pounds or something equivalent to go and see a gp and that obviously has an, a, a, an implication in terms of people thinking about, you know, what they want to do. So, I mean, I think there are there are different models. One of the things I was I was going to mention, if I may, would be that um, part of the reason that we haven't yet got the plan that is going to deliver all of this is that it requires fundamentally buy-in from not just citizens but also from from our staff, and not just from our current staff, but our future projected staff. So in, if I just take one example in, in Edinburgh, where uh, we have a, a, a practice in a very deprived part of Edinburgh, um, where a few years ago, they just simply were overwhelmed with demand, you know, a huge young population, um, a lot of um, um, substance misuse and alcohol misuse problems, and a, a quite a sort of chaotic population in many ways um, for the GPs to deal with. And they were just overwhelmed. They couldn't offer uh, appointments within a week or 10 days because they were just so overwhelmed. And the local GP there introduced a, a telephone triage system, which said, we're not, you can't just phone up and ask for an appointment. We're going to um, say to our population, you need to phone up and have a conversation with, uh, in fact, a GP, but um, latterly um, often not a GP as well, but initially a GP to say, okay, what is it you want to come in for? What is it about? What, just tell me a little bit about what you want to know. And that was really good to either signpost the person to say, well, actually, I can deal with that with a repeat prescription. Don't need you to come in and see me for that. I can ask the pharmacist to do that. You've got a musculoskeletal issue. You should be seen by a physiotherapist quickly. I can organize that. It doesn't require to come and see me. Or, in fact, where someone was having you know, a major problem that sounded really complex, the GP could say, okay, I will see you, but I'm going to give you a 20-minute appointment rather than come in for a five minute appointment now they've transformed the ability of the practice to respond in fact the day i visited the practice um to uh, chat to them about it they showed me their appointment book for that very day and there were still appointments vacant for that very day however when that practice stood up in front of 130 practices across lothian to describe their approach quite a few practices said we don't like that approach we we think that Primary care is all about uh, an interpersonal, long-term, face-to-face relationship with our patients and whatever. So the ability for um, uh, us as leaders to try to rapidly uh, implement what a appears to me as a, as a health service manager, a fantastic uh, solution that appears very patient-centered, actually, in the way um, uh, that it's been described. But... Um, uh, Quite a lot of other practitioners just don't 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 like that model at all. So we've got a we've got a job. But that's why I said, well, how big is this challenge? Well, I think it is a ten. That's not to say it can't be achieved. It's just I don't think we should underestimate how tough it's going to be. We've got so many stakeholders that we have to get in a line in order to implement a different way of responding to traditional demand. Absolutely. Very, very was the patient response to that new model? Oh, fantastic! Positive? Yeah, fantastic! Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. I know we're really pressed for... Yes, thank you. Uh, just on that point, Willie, thank you for pointing that out. We're, we're getting very pressed for time, so if we can uh, go to very quick questions and very quick answers, if you wouldn't mind. Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you, convener. I think um, everything I've heard this morning from all of our colleagues has been most interesting. Let me just give you a slightly different um, approach. You put together a joint submission. Now, if I can slightly deconstruct that a little bit and maybe ask you individually as... Um, senior executives in your own particular um, boards. What are you doing well in workforce planning that others might 
benefit from or be interested to, to hear today? I'll start in Ayrshire. Um, there, was a, there was a pause. Um, in Ayrshire, I think there's a number of things that I would highlight, uh, um, and some of them have been referenced. So, uh, reporting radiographers um, and looking to uh, develop that beyond just plain film, uh, looking at uh, biomedical scientists and pathology uh, and extending uh, roles. Uh, when I, I look at the, the work we've done in Ayrshire over many years around advanced nurse practitioners uh, and the scale and range of activities that our advanced nurse practitioners are now involved in. Uh, I think that's something that, that uh, we, we see positively uh, and indeed uh, on, on Cumbria, uh, the out of our service, we talked about that earlier, is um, an advanced nurse practitioner delivered service and very successfully delivered. Uh, I think in communities we're seeing some, some good uh, 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 developments around um, the eye care service I've referred to, so using other skills, but also through multidisciplinary teams, bringing in physios and pharmacists. For my part there, when you talked about eye care, I thought you were talking about I, like me, as in everything these days is iPhone, I, and you had a new system for people looking after themselves. <laughs> but I understand. Apologies. That. Thank you. <laughs> In order to brief, I'll be brief, I'll, I'll just use one, one example which combines uh, technology, regional collaboration and a little bit of innovation. So uh, one of the boards in our region just could not recruit radiologists, so therefore the reporting time for their film and their MRIs and their CTs and etc. was extremely challenging. In our region, we agreed to create a single radiology reporting system with a, with a single uh, technological base that would allow an image taken anywhere in the region to be reported by a radiologist anywhere in the region. So an, an image taken in Fife could be reported in Borders, an image taken in Edinburgh could be reported in Fife, you know, etc. And that has allowed us to be able to respond to what was a workforce challenge by regional collaboration added to digital technology. Oh, sorry, I was just giving you an example of what well, we I was done well. Something I others could perhaps learn yeah, from in that yeah. sense. No, I don't. So I'm, I'm in a slightly different position because my board is a national board and it's part of our raison d'etre to support other boards. But I guess if I was going to pull out one thing, I think what we have done over the last few years is really improve our capacity and capability around digital. And I think that's why we've got the ask to develop the platform. And the whole point of that is making sure that that, that, that information about the workforce is available on a once for Scotland basis to whoever needs to use that in terms of their planning. So improving that whole planning process. I very much support that. I think what Caroline has done in terms of the TURAS system um, and, and how to support boards in terms of education and training, I think is absolutely spot on. Two, three quick things, and I'll, I'll be very quick. I think the development of rules of clinical development fellows to plug some of the gaps and really taking doctors who want to step out of their formal training program for a period of time and, and actually giving them some experience before they get back on the training ladder. Uh, physician associates have mentioned, advanced nurse practitioners have mentioned. Um, and I think that's really struck me over the last two or three years and Grampian has been about the quality of medical and nursing and AHP leadership. So that professional leadership and team working and working together and working through issues. I think we've seen lots of redesign work going on in our surgical services and our operating theatres and that's progressed at a rate I've never seen uh, before. In Aberdeenshire and uh, in Murray we've seen a, a development called uh, Virtual Ward which is led by GPs, meet together with a practice team every morning and they look at the range of patients that are potentially could trip into a hospital admission and I think are these patients who are at risk who are vulnerable can we send a district nurse or a health visitor or whoever and make some intervention and support them in the home in order to avoid tripping into a hospital admission and that's one example that's actually been you know uh, you know developed right the way across Aberdeenshire and into parts of, of, of Murray and finally I think the, the collaborative work on delayed discharges I think has made a huge difference to the lives of many many patients but and also to the running of Aberdeen very briefly, Monica Lennon. Thank you. It was a supplementary um, to uh, Willie Coffey's uh, line of questioning. I suppose Willie was touching on how do we reduce demand and have fewer people going through the, the, the door of the, the doctor's <coughs> surgery. But the other side of the coin, and this is something that concerns me, is the people who don't access services, who don't 
get to the doctor or the pharmacist or the nurse and I'm thinking about Lanarkshire where I'm based and in particular uh, Tim you touched on uh, substance misuse and, and alcohol and drugs and I'm thinking about the the reduction in those kind of services and the people who don't get help quickly enough and it just actually increases demand on the NHS further down the line so what if we're going to see a continuation of particularly at local council level, some services being cut back. Is, is that just going to store up troubles for the future? How can we get these people who are quite hard to reach, how can we get them into services quicker? Well, it is going to store up problems for the future, and I think it is a major problem. And, and you know, we talk about prevention, and yet we also talk about the demand for Im Im improving treatment. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, the reality is the pressure on social care budgets has meant that... Um, you know, you really need to be at critical need of a service before you get it now in social care, as opposed to those, at, you know, at an earlier stage where prevention would help. I think there's a broad acknowledgement that is the case. It's probably back to what I was saying earlier about, um, you know, we we need some macroeconomic uh, choices to be made around this. I mean, if you pour all of the money available into, you know, elective waiting times, then that money is not available for primary care. If you put all of the elective, if you put all of the money into uh, you know, in, in increasing staff numbers, then the money is not available for new drugs, for all the money, you know, etc. So I, at the minute, the numbers just simply don't add up. And therefore, I think, you know, what we've got to do is have a, a short, medium and long term thing. I mean, although austerity has been around for 10 years, I mean, I, I, I've been in the health service for 34 years. I've worked under every shade of government. I've worked under times of plenty and times of great difficulty. And what I suppose I would learn from that is that things do get better uh, eventually. And so I think although we are saying, you know, the financial outlook looks really bleak for the next uh, three or four years, which it does, and, and, and that, that's a reality, I think if, if you hear one thing from us, it's about saying that we acknowledge that the short-termism around workforce planning hasn't helped, that we need to raise our gaze, we need to plan beyond austerity, and whether, they, whether the solutions are, you know, at a, at a UK level, at a Scottish uh, Parliament level or whatever, um, you know, a growing population with growing health needs will cost more money, frankly, and uh, that needs to be addressed fundamentally. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so, uh, just very briefly, Director uh, Paul Gray uh, will hear from next week. Uh, he currently has a dual role as NHS Chief Executive and Director General of the Scottish Government. Uh, I'm just interested in how that works in practice. Does, uh, in his capacity as NHS Chief Executive, what is his relationship with the Chief Executives? Is he directive? Is he consensual? How does it work? I mean, we, we, we meet with Paul and his, his directors formally on a, on, on a monthly basis. Um, so there's a lot of conversation, there's a, a, a lot of dialogue, um, and he's very clear with us about the policy of the government, about where the service is, is heading, what the priorities are, and we have those conversations. And I think it's one of the great things about working in, in Scotland, that people in our sorts of positions can have conversations with, with ministers, with senior government officials, and you know, we, we, we kind of know where, where things are heading. So you know, it, it's challenging at times, and I think you know, in our conversations with, with Paul, I think we're very clear with Paul about what the challenges are that we are facing, and he's very clear with us about what the priorities of, of the government are, at, but I think that's a, a useful, constructive conversation. Thank you. On that note, if there are no further questions, uh, that concludes our evidence session. So I'd like to thank very much the witnesses for the evidence you've given today. Uh, and I'll just break for a couple of minutes to move us into private session and allow the gallery to clear. Thank you. Thank you.